Thank you, everybody, for joining in today. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, just to let you know, uh, I do a lot of presentations throughout the year. Uh, I kind of know how this goes. You guys hide behind the Zoom screen. I stay here. Um, sometimes people get really quiet, but please don't. Feel free to open up those cameras, talk to me. Makes me feel like I'm not talking to myself. I get to talk to myself on my car rides. So if you have questions and you want to uh, engage, I would love that because I know your time is valuable and I'm here to make sure that you get the most out of this. So a little bit about me. I've been an advisor for over 15 years now. I operate in a fiduciary capacity. And what I specialize in is I help build plans for people that take the uncertainty out of retirement, I focus on academic research that gives people consistent income and helps them grow their assets in retirement, which is easier said than done. And one of the things that I subscribe to is I call a three bucket approach. I focus on developing a bucket of safety for, for people, a, con a consistency of income, and then growing their assets. And that's a philosophy that I've, I've worked for many years and given a lot of people great results. And it's something that uh, I'm going to try to share with you today. Although it is the seven pillars, uh, that three bucket approach is kind of the engine of the car that propels you forward. So I'll be touching on the seven pillars, but uh, just want to give you my approach and how I look at retirement planning. If you can see my screen, there's a QR code there. Uh, goes to a website, goes to our podcast. Um, and then on the bottom right, you should be able to see my uh, email and that will direct you to uh, a, a way to communicate with me if you have any questions. All right. Uh, part of the reason why I do these, uh, I do have a podcast that I run. That's been going for about five years. We are on a little break right now, but we'll probably uh, start recording again in the next couple of months. Uh, we're top ranked podcast, top 20 podcasts on retirement planning. And everything about our podcast is finance, career. Uh, two gentlemen you see there, if you can see the screen, one's an attorney and one is an executive at Airbnb. And we try to give people great advice with an entertaining spin that helps bring some value. But uh, I'm going to do the shameless plug. Subscribe. We really enjoy it, even though we're not putting out podcast episodes right now. But we got almost 200 episodes there. Uh, all types of great content. Professors from prestigious universities talking about finance and career. Uh, and some semi-famous people. So check it out if you got a long car ride. All right. So this is a little bit about my background, so you know who you're talking to and listening to today. Uh, I've been in wealth management since 2010. I do use a bucket strategy style approach when managing assets. Uh, I consider my expertise one of value investing. So for you guys that know who Warren Buffett is, he's a value investor. Uh, I kind of emulate that with a little bit more diversification. Uh, I consider myself a real estate investing expert. I've uh, done real estate investing on my own. Uh, I use academic-based research. I got my business degree from San Jose State, got my executive certificate in financial planning from San Francisco, and I'm an independent fiduciary. So uh, part of what I think I bring to the table uh, in my area of finance is I have been in all three of the major areas where I feel it's important to be an expert in to generate wealth. Uh, what makes the journey of building wealth so confusing is that there are so many different narratives of what works. And my myself, I've been confused along the journey of what works and what doesn't. Uh, I got my start in the financial industry working in an insurance related firm uh, and learned that scope of it and it was really valuable but when you focus in different areas you start to realize that whichever area you focus in the firms that you work for tout that as the solution and it's not always the best solution so through my experience i've been able to work in different areas and i'm able to give pretty non-partial non-biased advice that kind of incorporates all the more important areas together spent seven years at an asset management firm 
where we dealt with more liquid-based investments. And I've done a lot of real estate advising and investing on my own. So I try to bring all those areas together to kind of tell you what the best part of each of those areas is. And this is a little bit about my personal life. I really like soccer. So if you guys want to call and talk about finance, that's great. But I really love talking about soccer. I got my own little soccer team there. I got the world's cutest dog. That is a fact. And that's my wife and my family. All right. And before we go any further, uh, I'll just stop and see if there's anything Jonathan wants to bring in terms of a question. Uh, I'll have him look at the chat. But if you have something that you came here today for, throw that in the chat. I'm not good at looking at the chat. I already told Jonathan that. But um, it, uh, I will get to the question eventually at the end or he can he can uh, throw me some questions during this presentation. But for today, we're going to be going through these seven pillars. So we're going to be talking about your cash flow. We're going to talk about what should your savings look like? How much should you be saving? What's your budget in retirement, pre-retirement? We'll be talking about uh, best retirement plan design. Uh, what does that look like? How do you build an awesome retirement plan? We'll talk about managing your portfolio. What things should you invest in? What things should you probably skip? We'll talk about how you generate consistent income in retirement that's stable. We'll talk about how you protect your retirement. There's a lot of things that derail us when we get into retirement. I have, I work with uh, a few hundred households uh, and I've gotten to see the things that derail people's retirement. And when they think retirement is set, they're back to work or uh, in financial ruin. So I'll help spot those for you and tell you about those. We'll talk about living the life you've always wanted, why it's important to have an identity once you get into retirement. And we'll also talk about the mindset you need once you get into retirement. So we'll talk first about the cash flow, the savings rate. So how much should you be saving when you're in retirement? So I a lot of people feel like once they're in retirement, they don't need to save that much. But from what I've seen, it's always good to have a 5% of income savings goal once you're in retirement. It's very important. Uh, each situation is different, but I think a default rule is once you're in retirement, do not stop saving because unexpected expenses happen in your retirement and they will continue to happen. In fact, as your health goes, you'll be spending more in that area and you've got to prepare for it. So you'll have the best years of your retirement where you're healthy and doing things that you always want to do. And then you'll have the, the more challenging areas. And those are generally a little bit more expensive, but always have this mindset that you're going to save roughly 5% even when you're in retirement. Now, when you're leading into retirement, you want to save roughly 20%. That's the default rule. Like I said, every situation is different, but we try to encourage people to save about 20% of their income towards their investing, towards their savings. And in the budget, um, I'm going to open it up and see if anyone wants to participate, but uh, budgeting, what would you guess is the budget rule in terms of discretionary spending and essential spending. And so we'll go, we'll go three parts. We'll go your essential spending expenditures, your discretionary, which is your fund money, and then your savings. See if anyone can guess in the chat or chime in on what that number should be, what percentage, what percentage of your income should go to each of those three. This is the Jeopardy portion, folks. You guys can put your answers in the chat. Oh, Brittany. Good job, Brittany. Good job. Good. Charles, good answer. So I'm seeing, so right now it looks like Brittany's the, I'm going to give her the win. Um, but we try to aim for in the accumulation phase 50, 30, 20. That's what your budget should look like. So if you're not in retirement yet, but you are gearing up for it, you should go 50% of your money that comes in, your, sp or your spending, 
that should go to your essential expenses. That's your house, your insurance, food, 30%. That's what we call our discretionary or the fund money that should go to the trips, dining out, going to the movies. And then 20%, that should be going to your savings. And then it should be going to your investments. Now, when we get in retirement, it changes a little bit. So uh, I feel that should go to a 50 45 5. So, meaning 50% should be essential. 45% should be your discretionary or fund money. You earned it, you're in retirement. And that 5%, that's what's going to keep making sure you stay retired. It's going to help with all the unexpected things that show up in your life. But the 50 45 5, that's something I thought of and I've talked with other uh, people that are economists on it. And I think it's a good rule of thumb. Uh, we also look at Social Security and pension income. For some folks, that's going to be a big factor. Um, but main thing with your cash flow is make sure that you're going to be able to overcome most of your expenses in your retirement. That's that's the big key. Um, and having a good blend of investment income plus more stable income, such as pension income, Social Security, and investment contracts, that's a good that's a good way to design. Um, some people that work for more public uh, organizations have great pensions and that gives the consistency and they need to focus on building up the more liquid assets in their portfolio. And then some people that have worked at a company that maybe have a 401k, they have strong liquid assets, but they need to focus on the stable assets in the retirement, something more like Social Security. So everyone's going to have a different puzzle, but you each need to figure out what it is that you're lacking and how to strengthen it. Lee, uh, we had two questions. Um, one was, how do you save 5% when you're in retirement as we are no longer in accumulation phase? Um, and the other question I think was referring um, to the proportions and asking, is it realistic in the Bay Area? Great questions. So I will say if you're in retirement trying to save 5%, make sure you have the right cash position first. So in retirement, it's good to have one to two years in cash. Just because there's there could be major issues in your retirement in terms of uh, maybe a bad roof or you know things happen health-wise. And it's always nice to have one to two years of cash to cushion any of those unexpected situations. Uh, if you've got that part fulfilled, put it back to your investments. Um, you know, liquid investments is generally a good thing. Real estate is good if you have enough, but make sure you're putting that money to work. If you have more than two years sitting in cash, you're going to be losing to inflation. And that's kind of what we've seen uh, is that people that thought cash was king and great, uh, if they were in accumulation phase, and they were in the Bay Area, they couldn't buy a house because they thought, oh, I'm just going to keep it to cash. That's that's the smart decision. When really it's a devastating decision. And it's the same thing with your retirement. You need to make sure that money is deployed and being put to work because inflation at the end of the day is probably the biggest, uh, biggest thing that can deter your retirement and derail it. Uh, the most common anyway. And then realistic on the Bay Area. It's funny, I get this all the time uh, on especially the podcast because I preach it and the two guys that I run it with, they always give me a hard time. It's like 20%, that's ridiculous, blah, 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 blah. Um, really, you know, I understand the Bay Area is very expensive uh, and it is not feasible for a lot of folks. Uh, and I would say that you don't have to subscribe to that. And there's a lot of reasons why people stay in the Bay Area, Bay Area for family, for, for loved ones, uh, for their job. But really, the truth is, and it's hard to say this, is if you're not saving 20%, it's really hard to uh, say that you're going to be okay in retirement. It's just, that's the fact. So what people don't always like to hear that saving 20% is what they should aim for, is that they say it's not realistic, then you really need to consider, all right, am I in the right spot? Um, the Bay Area is it's, it's a tough place to live. It's one of the most expensive places in the world, unfortunately. 
And because of that, people need to really look at themselves in the mirror and say, can I really afford it? And uh, and if you can't afford it, is there going to be a point where you can't afford it? If that is not coming up in the near future, I do encourage people to say, all right, how can we how can we really lessen our discretionary spending? Uh, so instead of set spending, you know, uh, that 30 percent for discretionary, you got to cut it down to maybe 10 percent to make the numbers work. But it is it is challenging. So hopefully that was hopefully that was helpful. But uh, I just want to reiterate that I am so totally sympathetic to the high cost of living. Sometimes when I give these answers, people hate it. Um, but really, I'm just the messenger. So <laughs> uh, you got to think creatively, though. Uh, putting money towards investments is one way to if you are someone that says I have to live in the Bay Area, then you have to think strategically. You cannot say, I'm gonna put my money to cash. Um, I'm not gonna cut back on my discretionary. Those are all the wrong answers. You're going to have to definitely cut back on discretionary and you're going to have to be an investor. There's the only way that you can really have a, a chance at a retirement if you're not saving that 20%. So hopefully that was helpful. Um, going on to the second pillar, which is the retirement plan design. Very important, simple though, make sure you have a written plan. Uh, all too often people have thoughts of like, this is what I need in my retirement. This is what I'm trying to achieve financially. But 90% of the time people don't write down their goals. Uh, and this is something for myself that uh, took me a long time to figure out. Uh, when I started off in my own wealth journey, I had certain amounts of money I wanted to have in the bank, certain assets I wanted to purchase. And year after year, I didn't achieve those goals. And what really helped me was writing them down uh, on a Word doc with specific dates and avenues of how I was going to accomplish these goals. And when I started doing that, I got 10 times the amount of success. It's just something about writing it down, looking at it, keeps you focused. Uh, and it's something that's defined and attainable. So I would encourage all of you that are trying to, there's something in your mind financially that you want to accomplish. The most important step is probably writing it down so you can see it every day, maybe every week, uh, and then have pathways of how you're going to accomplish it. And going, I'm sorry, but we'll skip ahead, but uh, your short term is 12 months. Midterm goals are one to three, and then long term is three years and over. So try to work back, try to think of your big goal and work backwards. So going on to the planning strategy. So at a high level, this is what I try to subscribe to. It's the bucket strategy. And as you can see, there's three different buckets. I like to look at setting up first my emergency fund. That's for the unexpected events. So for people that have, um, let's just say single people that don't have anyone else, one source of income, or say they're married with only one source of income, that'll be the question. How much cash do you need to have in the bank? How many months of expenses should you have in the bank if you have one source of income for the household? I'm going to go back to the chat and we'll see who, see who the smart person is today. All right, good job, Ashley, Victor, nice, James, well done, Z, like it, good answers. So if you look for the textbook answer, one source of income is six months of your expenses. Now, let's just say you have two sources of income. You cut that down, it's going to go to three. So just keep in mind, if you have two sources of income, so if you're uh, married, you got two sources of income coming in, it's three. Or maybe you're by yourself, but you maybe have two jobs, right? You can go to three. Um, we got our defensive income bucket. So this is what's going to give you consistency during the bad times. So uh, if you're in accumulation phase, I try to have people have more conservative or balanced portfolios. 
in retirement. This could be uh, an investment income contract. It could be real estate income. And then we have our growth bucket. Our growth is how we accumulate our assets rapidly. And with that is going to come way more risk. And the reason why this is important is a lot of times people will focus on one bucket. And that's what I see that's really common. But by having this, it gives you different avenues and different stability in building your wealth. Uh, if you're going to go very aggressive, it gets really painful when the economy is in a bearish trend or when people are experiencing layoffs. So that's why you need to have all three. Um, so hopefully that is helpful. And just to reiterate, this is what we went through. The emergency bucket helps you stay out of debt. That's really important. Uh, uh, all too often, people, uh, I see people don't want to put a lot of cash on the side. So you're either one or the other. You either stack up way too much cash or you don't have enough. But the people that don't have enough end up getting in bad debt issues with credit cards. Um, they end up selling investments during bad times. I saw a lot of that over the last year and a half. A lot of people had to take losses on their investments because they didn't have enough sitting in their cash account. Here's your defensive income. This includes things like diversified income portfolios, social security, annuity, real estate income. And then you have your growth, real estate appreciation, sectors that outperform. When we're looking at assets to invest in i know there's a lot out there on uh, stocks you can invest in cryptocurrencies all that really look at the quality of the asset that's one of the most important lessons i can tell you if you walk away with anything today if you invest in anything make sure there's high quality behind it make sure it makes money uh way too much way too many people invest in things that don't make money and that's one principle from warren buffett that uh, I've always stayed true, uh, stayed true to in my own investing is making sure I understand cash flow and balance sheets really do matter. Uh, all right, so now on to pillar three, managing your investment portfolio. So these are the things that, some of these we touched on, but these are the things that you need to consider when you're uh, looking at your portfolio. Do you have a distribution strategy in retirement? What does that look like? How are you reinvesting that money that you distribute that you don't use? Uh, asset repositioning. Are you rebalancing your portfolio? Uh, if we have a portfolio that has 50% stocks, 50% bonds, over time, the bonds are going to outpace it. And then you're going to have a more risky portfolio. So while you're in accumulation phase and you're working up to your retirement, it's okay to not rebalance as much. But once you get closer to retirement, it becomes very crucial that you have someone that's going in there and rebalancing your portfolio. And then real estate investing, uh, I'll go a little bit more in depth than that, but I'll help you look at what are some valuable real estate strategies when you're looking at buying a real estate investment property. So these are areas to consider when you're looking at uh, investing. I know everyone here has heard of you know cryptocurrency. Um, it's a new new assets new asset class, but it comes with a ton of risk and a lot of uncertainty. Um, these are areas that are tested. There's a lot of research behind these strategies that I'm putting up or these sectors, and they have the performance numbers to back them. So number one is technology. So in the portfolios that I design, I am a big fan of making sure people have technology. Reason why is it's a theme that will never go out of style. We will always want better things. We will always want the latest iPhone, the latest computer, the latest, latest gadget. So technology is a, a great place to invest in. Health, we will always want to live longer, right? So that is a theme that will never go away. Consumer discretionary. So this is a lot of retail. You pick high quality retail that tends to do better than the overall market. And small cap stocks. Small cap stocks have significantly outperformed the larger companies, but you have to make sure that you're investing in quality, going back to the theme of quality. Um, so when we say small cap, 
Uh, those are things under the two billion mark, three hundred million, two billion. So not terribly small, but there's tons of growth potential there. When you look at the stock, always look at the size, the price, and the profitability. And with your fixed income and retirement, this is a big mistake that we see people make. Investing in fixed income that's too risky. So you get fixed income for a reason. In my mind, it's for safety. So make sure if you have fixed income in your portfolio, you have short-term versus long-term, because long-term is fixed income that's going to try to generate a higher rate of return. Instead of focusing on low credit, something that could default, a lot of portfolios have a lot of low, low credit quality investments. Look at higher credit. That's important. And you want to look at the bond alternatives that could also replace your bonds. All right. And I will. Lee, we, we had a couple of questions here. Um, one person um, asked, what is fixed income? Fixed income, it could be anything is like a long term CD, and it can be bonds. So, bonds, they pay out a. Basically, when you invest in a bond, they're going to pay you a coupon. They're going to pay you a more consistent rate of return. Um, but the thing with bonds is that they're not always stable. And a lot of times when people say, oh, if you're investing for safety, invest your money in bonds. The issue is it is fixed income, but the price of the bond could fluctuate. It, the greatest example that I can give you right now is if you look at the last year and a half, we heard about all the banks that were on the brink of failure. A lot of that had to do with the bonds. They put their money towards the bonds because they thought the bonds would generate them a uh, rate of return that was modest and without a lot of risk. Unfortunately, with the high interest rates, the bond prices plummeted, some 15%, some up to 25%. And then the banks were in a situation where people were taking money out and they had to sell those bonds at a loss. And that's how we got uh, multiple bank failures. But theoretically, your bonds are going to provide more liquid safety than your stocks. So if you have a volatile period uh, in the economy, it's not uncommon for your stocks, your stock portfolio, if you have a well diversified portfolio, for it to go down 30 to 50 percent now your bonds they're gonna they should do a little bit better um but you know for the for this last year and a half they went down you know 15 25 percent because of interest rate risk during times like 2008 when it's not really interest rate interest rate risk uh but it's more of the global financial system uh those went down as a whole, maybe roughly 5%. So not as much. I mean, some went down more than others, but it wasn't as bad. So the moral of the story is they are more safe than stocks overall if you have good diversification, but they're not bulletproof. And they do pay out fixed coupons. So if you put $1,000 in, it might have a 5% coupon. It's going to pay you $50. Hopefully that makes sense. I won't go too much into the uh, the research, but I just wanted to back up a lot of the concepts that I'm giving you today. These are not my opinions. What I'm doing is I am taking people that have won Nobel Prize, multiple Nobel Prizes, and I take their research and I'm bringing it here to you today. So just so you guys know that, you know, I think one of my issues is like being in the financial arena is there's too many opinions out there, not enough that's backed by science. So I'm just showing you the data that's backing up a lot of the things that I'm talking about. Profitability matters, the size of the company matters, interest rate matters. Right here, what we're doing, we're looking at portfolios from 1970 to 79, and we're looking at smaller companies, diversification versus the S&P 500. So what we call the general market. So when people talk about the stock market, we're talking about most of the time the S and P 500. We've come to a time where everyone thinks it's just the right answer to always put money in the S and P 500 because it's had such a great run. But there's been times throughout history where it hasn't done so well. So I'm going to try to give you guys an idea of why we diversify. 
So right here, you look at charts from 1970 to 79. You look how the S&P underperformed a more global approach, investing overseas, investing in smaller companies. We go to the 80 to 89, same thing. We have outperformance from the global diversification approach in smaller companies. We go from 90 to 99. Now, this is where we had the, the tech boom. All the internet companies were coming to the forefront. So that changes, changes things. S&P basically outperformed the global strategy significantly. So every dollar you put in, you got $3.59 with a global investment as being you're getting probably five dollars and thirty three cents you go from 2000 to 2009 now this is what we call the lost decade so for people that uh don't like to invest in the market I mean, a lot of the naysayers the people that are more pessimistic about investing they'll say well they always look back at this time so it's like, oh that's the lost decade why would you invest in the market this shows you why you would invest in the market, because even though it was the worst decade in you know, the stock market's history, if you had a global approach, you still doubled your money, right? So that goes back to the power of when you're in retirement, if you want to have all your assets in the S&P 500 or all one sector, no, you want to make sure you're using modern portfolio theory and you're taking you know, growth. Uh, you're taking value investments, you're taking international, you're taking emerging markets, and you have fixed income that all works together to give you better results. And even if you're going through the worst of times, you can have good outcomes. And this is a more recent 2010, 2018 S&P outperforming global markets. But if you look at it from the beginning or say, you know, the 70s to now, we understand that having a more global approach really does matter. You get, I mean, it's done a lot better. So just, you know, you can't tell what's going to happen one year to the next or even in one decade, right? So a lot of people are like, oh, look what happened the last five years. That's not a big enough scope to make a conclusion. So my point to you is to make sure that you have an approach that isn't just good for one year or one decade, but takes history into play. All right. Another way to generate uh, good retirement is real estate investing. So I'll touch on this a little bit. Uh, it gives you passive income if you do correctly. You have a great way to create equity, not just through appreciation, but the work that you do on the property. So for my investment property, uh, I'm just putting a lot of work into it to increase the value because it, real estate is an imperfect asset, which means you can do things to the property and create more value. So uh, for a lot of times when people have real estate properties and they're trying to generate more money, think about what you can do to upgrade the property, increase the value, and then maybe go to the bank and look at the possibilities of doing a cash out by refi or taking a HELOC on the property to take some of that equity out. You have to be creative, but there's different ways to make real estate appreciate for you. Understand with real estate, you have the benefit of leverage on your side. A lot of people look at leverage as a negative. I look at it as a positive when done correctly. Uh, you're basically taking your money and amplifying it 8x, 9x by going to the bank. So that's a very powerful concept. And that's why in the Bay Area, in the world, we see so many people that successfully retire through real estate. So I'm a big, you know, big believer in myself. It's one of the things that I subscribe to that does work. And it's a great hedge against inflation. My tip on real estate, if you're going to buy, do not buy in, in the desert, do not buy the most cheapest property. What you wanna do when you're looking at your real estate is you wanna buy in the path of progress. So take the popular area where things are maybe overvalued or too expensive and look out from there 20, 40 minutes to where people can live for cheaper and buy there. So, we all think alike, you know, in terms of real estate. You either you want to be in San Francisco or San Jose, but you can't afford it. So people that have some money but not the money to buy there, they buy on the perimeter. And so if you're looking for a great real estate investment, instead of investing in, say, a San Francisco, go out from there and see where the path of progress is. 
or look at Sacramento, which is still affordable, but that area has now gone up in price, and look out from there and see what towns are getting people moving to it, where is the population growth happening? And then when you buy your investment, make sure you don't buy it based off of how you feel, but always do a cash on cash analysis and do an analysis on the total return to make sure it's the right property. So that's what I do for a lot of people in the real estate space. I make sure the numbers make sense. So if you're getting into real estate, make sure you do those calculations as well. Lee, I just wanted to give a heads up that we have about 20 minutes left in the, the program. Just a little time check there. Thank Thanks. you so much. All right. So looking at your different sources of income in your retirement. You have your Social Security. You have pension income. You have annuity income. You have retirement savings. You have brokerage account income. You have real estate income and savings income. So when you're getting into retirement, think about where is the stable income going to come from, right? It's good to have a portfolio that you can draw off of, but in here, in this list, you have more stable sources. And for people in retirement, a lot of people in retirement, that is what they need. They need stability. So how can you use these and generate more stability? All right, on to pillar four. So I'm going to look, we're going to look at two different concepts on how people generate income in retirement. Um, and these are the two that I subscribe to and two that I've seen that have worked for people that I've been working with for over a decade now that have been taking money from their portfolio and a lot of times have more money than they started with, but have been able to live off their retirement. So first one is the investment only approach. Now, this is a really common approach that we're seeing with people that work at Fisher Investments, Morgan Stanley's, the Charles Schwab's of the world. And the features with this is they use modern portfolio theory. Going back to the uh, U.S. stocks, international emerging markets, fixed income, they use that and they use different, sec different divisions of that to create a portfolio that generates consistent like returns. And it's a great way to retire. It's, it's upheld the test of time. Yes, people have gotten uh, maybe a seasick from the volatility, but if they stick to the distribution rule, the 4% distribution rule, they have generally been fine with the right allocation and the right distribution. Now, things that mess it up is if they take larger amounts out of the portfolio during their retirement, that can mess things up. Um, but it's been a great way and one of the most common ways that people are retiring today. Now, the risk of it is you have a low risk of running out of money. Say the markets don't behave like they've behaved in the past. You could run out of money that way, um, but there's a low risk. You have 50 years of historical data. Uh, modern portfolio theory came about in the 1950s. It was based off research of many years before that, and it's been reliable. Um, some of the other advantages is a legacy plan. Uh, if you're trying to transfer assets to your heirs, having a liquid portfolio is one of the best ways because if a husband or wife pass, you get a step up in basis on the investments. If it's in a regular investment account and all that money that would be taxable, let's say maybe a capital gains rate, if it was invested for a year, it's a full step up. So you avoid those taxes and it passes on to your heirs. So there is a good advantage with uh, you know, this investment approach. The cons are stock distributions and bear markets. You can, if you're taking money out and maybe you're only drawing down 4%, you should be fine, but you are draining that portfolio a little bit more than you probably should because you don't want to sell stocks at a bad time, but this approach relies on you taking money during the bad times and the good times. So one of the negatives is if you have to take out distributions during the bad times, it's doing more harm to your portfolio than it is during most of the times. Um, and also, you have issues with bonds, uh, the low interest rate environments. Uh, bonds, last time I checked on the 10-year uh, U.S. bond aggregate, the bonds had averaged maybe about a percent and a half, roughly. So bonds haven't performed that well in recent in recent times. Um, hopefully that changes, but 
we seem to be in a more low interest rate environment, and that is going to be problematic for bonds probably for the near future in terms of their returns. Now, pillar, uh, still on pillar four, but now we're going to talk about an insurance plus investment approach. Now, this is another strategy that I've seen that works really well for people in retirement. What they do now, these are the people that have backed this approach. Uh, this is Wade Bam from Princeton. You got Roger Ibbotson from Yale. But they've done extensive research on why this is their favorite approach. And what it is is they use an investment contract from an insurance company called a fixed index annuity. Now, annuities, I know there's a negative, there's some people have a negative mindset or, uh, you know, annuities they just don't trust. There's different types of annuities, all different types. There's FIAs, EAs, variable annuities, very different, right? You can't all categorize into one. But when used appropriately, you can use something like a fixed index annuity that's low cost, has high cap rates, high participation rates to replace your bonds. And what that does is it gives you something that's going to probably outperform your bonds and give you more consistency. Now, the the negative with it is you're giving up liquidity to the insurance company. So that's something you have to think about. Um, and sometimes you do have higher costs of insurance, but a lot of these products, the cost in them is about 1%. Now, is it right for everybody? No, but you have to be the judge if it's something that you would feel comfortable with. If you want consistent income that maybe steadily rises over time, but you're not gonna have to worry about running out of money, this is a really good strategy for folks that don't need the liquidity for a portion of their money. And so their research is based off of not all the money being put in a product like this. And that's how people get in trouble is putting way too much money towards something like this, but having 20 to 40% of one's money towards a product like this and replacing the bonds can make a lot of sense. On to pillar number five. Okay, so this is the retirement protection portion. What things can derail a retirement? Not having life insurance. Um, I subscribe most of the time to term insurance. So if an investment person tells you they have a life insurance contract that's going to make you money, I would say personal experience, don't do it. Um, I've seen way too many horror stories with IULs and BULs and whole life that don't ever perform up to how they're presented. It's very common, uh, but you can make an argument that most people do need some sort of term insurance because it's inexpensive. And if someone dies prematurely, you're taken care of, right? So life insurance protection, the right side uh, is definitely important. Liability protection. So for most of you, make sure that you have an umbrella policy, if you have any assets, or even if you don't, and you can afford it. Liability protection, umbrella protection is important because you can get sued. And in California, unfortunately, if you get sued, the courts can go after you for 10 years. They can go after your assets, they can go after your income. And you could be working for 10 years for somebody else, garnishing your wages, and they could even go up to 20 years. They can reapply after the 10th year, go for 20 years. So that's something that's really scary to think about, but it happens. People get sued and as you get more assets, the likelihood of you getting sued goes up. So look at having an umbrella policy. Talk to your insurance person. Um, I carry $2 million on myself, and it's really not that expensive. It's pretty affordable and pretty reasonable. Health insurance. We never know when our health is going to go south. I had a knee a surgery uh, you know, a decade ago. It cost, cost $200,000. I didn't have that sitting around. So it's nice that I had health insurance, right? Health insurance is one of the common reasons why people get into financial ruin. So never uh, think you can go without it. We all think we're going to be healthy when we're young, but as we go, the odds go against us. So always have some sort of health insurance, even though uh, it can be expensive, it's worth having. As we get into retirement, long-term care becomes an issue. We're seeing people live longer now uh, with more sickness, unfortunately. And it's expensive. So one client I'm working with right now, we're trying to figure out how to how to deal with thirty thousand dollars a month in uh, healthcare costs. And 
We'll figure out a solution for it, but it's expensive right now. Uh, but long-term care insurance can help in those situations. And then estate planning, make sure that you have a plan for your estate when you go. And these are the big threats to the to your retirement plan. Most common one that we're seeing right now is inflation. Everyone's been talking about it for the last couple of years, but this has always been the biggest threat to most people's retirement. Uh, people don't take it into account, but if you look at the cost of something 10 years ago or 20 years ago, you see it. And, it's, and your purchasing power is always going down, unfortunately, especially with how most governments work, spending way too much money, printing too much money, that leads to inflation. So, and this is why I would make the argument that unless you have millions and millions in the bank, it is essential for the majority of us to be an investor at some level because of inflation. You cannot rely on cash, and if you do that, it's going to be really, really tough, and you're probably not going to make it. So you have to, in some way, be an investor. Taxes. Taxes are always going up. So you have to plan for that accordingly. Make sure you're getting the money and investments that uh, tax advantage and uh, maybe won't be taxed at ordinary income. You have market volatility. That's another threat. People get scared in their retirement. Maybe they don't have the, the right portfolio and they, they're spending their money down and you see uh, people make bad moves in retirement. Uh, because they were too volatile and it could be a big issue. So market volatility you need to address. Threat four. Now threat four might be the most common one that I've been running across lately that where I see people in a bad situation is being too conservative. So a lot of people feel like, oh, we just don't have the stomach to invest in the market or to do any investment. And these same people I was working with maybe close to 15 years ago, uh, couldn't get them to invest enough. They only put a little bit in because they couldn't stomach it. And now the cost of everything has risen significantly and they're in trouble. They're doing reverse mortgages on their house. They have very little in bank in terms of cash. And it's because they were too conservative. So uh, I think being conservative makes people feel responsible. Uh, or not taking risk makes them feel smarter. I'd say the answer is somewhere in the middle. Like with investing, it's kind of like a Venn diagram. Got to get that sweet spot. Um, but being too conservative is a great way to have a, a really bad retirement. Threat five, not budgeting. In retirement, you know, for some reason, for the first couple of years, spending actually goes up higher because people get bored. So make sure if you're entering into retirement, you, uh, you, you do a really good job of budgeting and not going too crazy. You can have some fun, but not too much. Poor investment management, uh, investing in your brother-in-law's t-shirt business, uh, putting all your money into a new startup, uh, putting all your money in cryptocurrency. These are things that I'm joking about, but I see them too often. So uh, try to have especially in your retirement, have really good investment approaches, not the time to gamble. And threat seven, we touched on this, long-term care. Long-term care consistently is becoming more of an issue as we live longer. All right, on to pillar six. So living the life you've always wanted. Uh, this is, it, you know, it sounds very touchy-feely, feel good, but man, I cannot stress how important this is. Uh, one thing in my job that I didn't expect was all the depression and mental issues and uh, mental illness that I see with people that are in retirement. Uh, it's rampant now. Uh, maybe it's always been that way, but um, people get can get very depressed in retirement. Um, I'll even talk about my own father. My own father was really successful when he was working. He was a CEO of a company. Uh, an ag company in Watsonville. It did pretty well for himself. Um, and then he got laid off right, in, right before his uh, age 65. He was almost to retirement, but what really threw him for a loop, a loop is he didn't have a life. 
after his working years. And he suffered with depression, suffered from alcoholism, and it was really tough for him. Someone that has always been successful his whole life didn't know how to handle retirement because he didn't have anything that he thought of that he could do after work. So now it's made me realize the importance of friendships, you know, finding a purpose in your retirement, figure out how you're going to make society better, figure out something that is really near and dear to your heart. Those are important, not just because we want to help people, but it really helps with your own well-being in retirement. And it becomes more important. So uh, really focus on that if you're not in retirement yet. Think about your friend group, your peers, uh, and really spend more quality time with them because it matters more in retirement than it does in your working years. And on to pillar seven, these are the mindsets that you need to have in your retirement. Making sure that you have a written plan, going back to the beginning. Having a written plan is extremely important with pathways and times. That's how people accomplish their goals. Uh, being disciplined, right? Don't spend, you know, don't go off your budget. Be willing to sacrifice. Uh, be willing to move if you can't afford to live in the B area. Think about how you can lower your cost of living or maybe even move to someplace that's going to make it feasible for you to retire and get ahead financially. Uh, have a passion, right? When you get in retirement, it can be boring. And uh, it becomes more important to find something that you're passionate about, something that you feel is going to impact society in a positive way. Purpose, same thing. Want to make sure that you're working something purposeful is it your family have a long-term outlook and don't procrastinate so hopefully that helps i will open it up with questions with my remaining five minutes thank you so much lee um i will try to um there, we had some questions that were uh, similar so i'll try to um combine them a little bit um so there were questions about um, like what happens if you're getting a late start on um, on planning for retirement? Like if you're in your 40s, um, would that change um, the uh, the percentages you mentioned? Um, like if you were just starting to plan, if you've been living paycheck to paycheck your whole life, um, how would that affect uh, retirement planning? If you're starting later, Unfortunately, the numbers, you know, that you say theoretically should go up. But like I said, these are just numbers that apply to the masses, right? Everyone's situation is different. But you are going to, if you are behind, you're going to have to think creatively in how you can catch up. Now, is that saving every dollar into a portfolio? Or is that trying to work to get to your house, your first house, and have that as your, you know, uh, your bridge to retirement? Maybe your goal should be getting into property that maybe isn't around here, maybe it is, it's hard to afford the Bay Area, so that maybe getting into real estate and becoming a real estate investor, that's, those are things that I would consider if I was really behind. Uh, how can I get a property and rent it out? Uh, you have to start thinking creatively when you're behind. That's the truth, right? There is no easy answer. Like if you're starting in your 40s and 50s, you have to really be creative so some creative strategies I've seen that work in that situation is, you know, buying a property that's outside the Bay Area that's cheaper, renting that out uh, for income, renovating it also if you can use like uh, construction loans. But those are ways that I've seen work for people or selling the property if they have one here in the Bay Area. I'm assuming everyone's kind of in the Bay Area and moving out of state. Those are the more creative things that you have to start really considering if you're behind. But uh, savings, there is no substitute for. And I know it's tough. And like I said, I sympathize with people that have a lot of uh, difficulties in their finances. It's real, it's valid, but you have to start thinking, how can I save some money and how can I get ahead 
and think outside the box. So those are some of the ways that I would recommend, but there is no substitute for saving some money. Okay. Um, let's see. We had a question. Is something like Acorn a good first step in investing? If you can't commit the money, you should. Um, and then they said 20% in parentheses. I think the 20% is the bar, the high bar that we aim for. Investing something is better than nothing, right? That's that's so don't get deterred that I said 20%. Uh, if you can only save 5%, that's a start. And that gives you options. That gives you the ability to save for something big that can that can move the needle. Uh, so yeah, if you want to just start with Acorn and that's all you can do, go ahead and do it. Just make sure you're investing in something that's worth investing in. Don't be investing in things that are fly-by-night companies, get rich overnight companies. Those don't work out in my experience. Although you see a bunch of people on TikTok and YouTube that will claim it works, uh, just haven't seen that often. So invest in quality, do what you can, and maybe you know by doing that it presents an opportunity. Maybe not a few years down the road, but maybe ten years down the road, you're able to get into your first house if you're really struggling, um, and then through there you get appreciation and. There's different ways to do it, but the the main goal is do what you can, right? If you can't do 20 and you can only do an acorn count and you can save a little bit consistently, that's great. Um, okay, we had um, a couple questions on real estate investing, which um, might be beyond the scope of, of this uh, presentation, but um, let's see. Um, with real estate investment, is it good to be the landlord or hire a property manager? That all depends on where you're at geographically to your property, how much bandwidth you have. Uh, for me, for my property, I am kind of the property manager. I have some people that help, uh, but it, it totally depends. Do you have only an easy family? Then you probably don't need a property manager. If it's just a family of four and they don't give you any problems yeah you're probably good now if i'm if i'm renting to a frat house i'm probably going to need more like more time up there and more eyes up there and i, I probably want to get a property manager the manager involved in that situation so i think it depends on your situation the higher complexity the higher distance yes but if you got something that's close that you can get to and Going back to the example of the family, you probably can go without a property manager. Okay, we had a couple of questions on insurance. Um, one was, how much umbrella insurance do you think someone should carry and how can they determine what amount? And then there was another question that they didn't understand the point of life insurance if you don't have any dependents or heirs. Um, is that... Like, what is the point of having life insurance if you don't have dependents or heirs? Okay. Um, going to the umbrella, make sure you look at the, all the assets that you have. Take that into account. And then look at trying to gauge, like, what you could potentially be sued for. Look at, like, theoretically, if you were in a lawsuit, what would, they, what would that amount of damages be? And try to get it covered. So I think... You know, I think that's a good point. Look at all the assets you have, make sure that's covered, and then make sure that your income in a way is covered as well. Look at your income over 10 years and add that to the formula. And I think that'll get you close to what you need. So I carry two mil probably under what I should, but I think it's good enough. And if I went to court, I think they would settle for something that my umbrella covers. Uh, but that's that's the best way to do it. So I'd say if you're starting out, maybe you only need a quarter million, you know, of umbrella. But as you get more assets, it's going to go up. So take your assets, take your working income times ten years, and I think that's going to be a good ballpark. Life insurance. If you don't have anyone that depends on you, you don't need it. But a lot of insurance agents will say, "Oh, you always need life insurance." 
they don't. They don't need life insurance. So if you don't have anyone that depends on you, your income, you don't need it. Um, if you have kids, you have a wife that would be in trouble, or, or a husband or kid that would be in trouble, you should you should really consider it. But look at term insurance. Don't look at I'm just not a fan of a lot of the permanent products. I part of my job when I was working at the insurance company was I had to look at old policies that were sold in the 80s and 90s and go make calls to people uh, when their policies were about to lapse or expire. And I got a lot of uncomfortable situations and it opened my eyes to how those policies perform. So um, if you are someone that says, when I die, I need my family to have a, a sum of money, and that is what is the most important thing to me. Then you should, then you want permanent insurance. But if that's not the answer, it's hard for me to justify that. But hopefully that answers your, your question on the life insurance. Um, okay, we are uh, past five o'clock. So um, if if you don't mind, Lee, uh, just like a couple, two two last questions. Um, Absolutely, I'll stay on for every question. Okay, um, so um, your thoughts on passive versus actively managed investments? Depends on the, depends on the, uh, the investment. So if it's if it is a uh, portfolio of index funds or mutual funds, I think passive is great. You, and if you got if you invest in a good sector, uh, passive is the way to do it. Uh, there's too many active funds that just don't back up the performance. Their performance tends to lag. But if you're someone that has single stocks, maybe you have a lot of company stock that's appreciated, you probably need someone that knows what they're doing that's a good active manager. So when you have single stocks, it's different. But I'm someone that I really can't subscribe to these mutual funds with the active managers because there's just so few that actually uh, perform better than the passive investments. Um, what should you look for in a financial advisor? Um, you should look at, are they independent? Reason being is because if they're not independent, they're going to have to push a certain product or investment. That's the the dirty secret of the financial industry. When we're not independent, we can only give you Bank of America solutions. But we can only give you Morgan Stanley solutions. You want someone that can go outside of that. And you know, you want someone that can offer different different solutions, right? The the, the solution should not always be elect insurance nor should the solution always be a liquid portfolio, nor should the solution always be real estate. You need, you, you need someone that's willing to be objective and uh, not biased. I think those are the most important things. I think experience matters also. Um, although I'm grateful for everyone that worked with me in my first five years, there's a lot I didn't know. And there's a lot that I messed up on that's just part of the learning curve. So. If you uh, take on, I'm not, I'm not saying that you should shy away from people that are new, but be aware that that's a risk that you take when you come with anyone that's new in anything, right? There's more of a risk of error. Um, but I think those are the important things. Look at, look at, look at that, uh, w where their interest lies, uh, and can they be objective in their thinking? I think, and experience, those things. Okay. Um, there was a question from earlier um, about um, expense ratios. Um, and do you have an opinion of what is reasonable? Uh, under 30 bips, 30 basis points, I think that's reasonable. If you're looking at a fund that will have that expense in there, I think under 30 bips is fine. Don't get too caught up in the expenses also. Uh, you know, there's this big wave of people that are just low cost is better. Trust me, it's not. It's like if you're getting some sort of service or special feature, really take that into account because I've just seen so many people devastated by this low cost uh, philosophy and they're just doing things wrong uh, 
buying the wrong funds. So if you have a quality fund, sure, uh, keep it under 30 bips. But sometimes there's different uh, there's different investments out there that charge a little bit more that provide value. Going back to the example of people that have appreciated stocks um, and they don't know how to they don't know how to get out of that stock without the big tax liability. A lot of times for a fund like that, you're going to pay a lot more so you can get that tax loss harvesting on a daily basis so you can whittle down your tax bill and it's going to cost you more. So each situation is different. Think about what the need is. But if it's just standard, I don't really have a specific need. I'm just trying to put some money to work. Sure, go with a lower expense ratio. Okay. Um, I think we should probably wrap this up. Um, I just wanted to thank you, Lee. This was a fantastic presentation. Um, I certainly learned a lot. Um, I apologize to anyone if um, any questions got lost in the chat. Um, feel free to uh, contact um, our department. The email address is bizsci-tech at sfpl.org, and we will do our best to direct you to um, some good uh, information on your question. Um, and uh, don't forget, we have a lot more programs uh, the rest of the month. Um, you can head to um, sfpl.org. Um, there's a link to Financial Capability Month on the top of the page to find out about our other programs. Um, so thank you so much, Lee. Uh, we really appreciate thank this. Thank you. I appreciate the time that uh, spent with you guys. And thank you for putting the questions in there. Hopefully it was helpful. But uh, yeah, it's it nice that I could spend some time with you guys today. And I know your time is valuable as well. So I appreciate you all showing up. Okay, and just a, a reminder, because I am seeing some questions. Um, we will be sending a recording of the presentation um, to everyone who uh, joined us today. Um, we will not be sending slides, but you can see the slides in the in the recording. So uh, keep an eye out for an email with uh, the recording and a, and a brief survey you can fill out to let us know how we're doing and uh, things you might like to see us uh, provide programs on in the future. All right, thanks a lot, Lee. Thank you everyone for joining us and hopefully we'll see you at our, our next events.